Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another fabulous episode of the Healthcare Trail Leisures podcast. Very excited to be sitting here today with uh, the amazing Nicole Bradbury. Nicole has been involved in value-based care, which is the obvious central theme of this entire podcast, since before it was even called value-based care. Uh, since then, Nicole has been involved in multiple organizations, starting organizations, growing organizations, all in the value-based care space. Um, she is involved at top level with very large ACO groups and other just really interesting things. So excited to kind of dig into it. Nicole seems to have a really, really good understanding of um, the entire value-based care space, where we need to go, where kind of the mistakes that we've made. Um, so I think there's going to be a ton of value here. Nicole, thank you so much for sitting down with us today. Sure. Thanks for having me. So um, before we get into all that, where did you grow up and why did you get involved in healthcare? So I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm one of those few people that's actually a native Floridian. Love it here. Don't want to live anywhere else, even though I've probably traveled the world a couple of times. But, um, um, you know, Florida, Florida in my book is is where, where we have the best you know, life you can live. So anyway, um, how I got into healthcare? Well, you know, I was this dumb kid in college figuring out what I was going to do. And my brother came along and said, hey, there's this thing called actuary. And um, he goes, you should look at it. I think I think it's got a good 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 livelihood. And so I ended up going to school, getting a math and statistics degree, actuarial minor, and then um, started down that path and realized that if I had actually gone down that career, I probably would have stuck pencils in my eye for the rest of my life. It wasn't me. <laughs> I I actually like people and like to be out of a cube. And so shifted very early on to um, to I still stayed in healthcare. I, I actually got a job at Cigna Health. Um, managing their patient satisfaction survey and very quickly moved out of that into more kind of, you know, big systems, internal consulting, kind of, you know, did everything within a payer side and, and ended up doing quality and affordability, which I said earlier was kind of the genesis of what we now call value-based healthcare. Yeah. So let's talk about that a little bit. So what did value-based care look like before it was value-based care? And what was, what was that genesis? Where did the country, like, where did it start that shift where we started talking about maybe a different kind of contract than a fee-for-service and what was the genesis of value-based care well you know you're too young to remember but we used to have these things called hmos and um you know and hmos really weren't popular with with members and patients but they did they did keep costs at a certain level and trends were sitting at about six or seven percent when hmos were the the prominent model and then around kind of the late 90s the ceo of united healthcare came out and said we're no longer going to tell doctors um, what they can do, what they can't do, utilization management. They removed all of that. And then trends started creeping up 10, 11, 12, 13, 14%. And healthcare costs all of a sudden became unaffordable. And, you know, people in small businesses stopped carrying healthcare. You know, insurance was, you know, becoming a, a, a big deal. And so United Healthcare, along with some of the other big payers, said, ooh, we can no longer just put profit on top of premium. We got to figure out how to stop this this." this cost trend because people are, are no longer able to afford health care. And so internally, United Healthcare, um, and I'm sure others, you know, went in and said, okay, let's look at healthcare differently. What are the levers that really drive cost and quality and put teams together? And I was part of that. We shaved under those programs about a billion dollars off of United's fully insured book. So very successful. But we also learned at that time Sorry. what no no you, you can't uh, just you can't just run past that. You shaved a billion dollars off <laughs> You shaved a billion dollars off how? <laughs> what exactly? So we you? had we created we created all kinds of programs. We created programs around medication. You know, just a program that said um, instead of using Nexium, Nexium, use Prilosec. You know, let's try Prilosec first. Um, that shaved you know hundred million dollars just in one little program. You know, we said okay, let's look at orthospine and say you know why you know, let's, let's deviate people to physical therapy in Cairo before they go to an orthopedic surgeon. Just that one program shaved costs off of, you know, what we thought were unnecessary surgeries, et cetera. You know, we, we funded some of the first patient-centered medical homes, you know, realizing at that time that if we could really engage the doctor to engage the patient, look at their care holistically, that we could fundamentally change, you know, the trajectory of people's care, keep them out of the hospital, keep them home, healthy, happy, all of that stuff. And so we had all of these different programs that we looked at from a patient's perspective and a diagnosis versus the traditional way payers had managed cost, and it was very successful. But when we did that, you know, even though we were very successful in shaving, like I said, a billion dollars off of United's fully insured spend at the time, we, we, there were so many places we couldn't move the needle. We could never get past a 10, 11% engagement rate with patients because we weren't the, you know, the payer was not their trusted advisor, yes. their provider was. And yeah. we were in conflict a lot of times with the provider. 
And, um, and so we thought, how can we get close to the provider? We realized that these nurse lines that we had created in the payers really didn't solve the problem we were trying to solve, which was unnecessary hospitalizations, because we really weren't, um, you know, we, we, those folks on the phones were kind of risk adverse and we weren't really in the, you know, day to day of the patient. And so we couldn't move that needle. And so a few of us that have been part of those programs kind of decided to leave United, take that knowledge and formed a company um, back in 2009 called Rise Health, which was really to say, how can we take those sophisticated programs that we had built within United, wrap them around doctors and help doctors manage risk? Right. Yeah. And that was, you know, shared savings, risk, whatever the model looked like. And so we did that. We built some cool technology. We built one of the first patient center, patient relationship management systems. We did some work on the front end of Boston Medical Center, did some work down in Texas, which is was a, a prominent doc down there that now has a big value based network. But we did some stuff, but we just were ahead of any contract. There was no contract other than maybe in Boston under Romney at that time that that incented doctors or anyone for managing cost. Yeah. And so, so, so it, it is a huge challenge to actually get it down to the doctor level because doctors, as we know, are typically not business people and they just want, they don't want to be concerned with all this, all these things, coding and this and that. They just want to be concerned with taking care of their patients. So how did you do that? What were some of, some of those initiatives to take the good theoretical, you know, program all the way up here and bring it all the way down to the, to incentivizing the doctor to actually pull them in to the conversation in a meaningful way and say, we need you to change X, Y, Z that you're doing with the patient on a day to day. How do you, how do you translate that and make it meaningful to a doctor? Well, first you have to have the, the right incentives lined up, right? And that's where the, the value-based contracts come in place. The very first one out of the gate was the Medicare shared savings program through CMS. It really launched what we now call value-based healthcare through that contract. And so you can align the incentives of the, of the providers to think about downstream costs, not just what's in front of them. You know, think, think about primary care. Primary care is not proactive typically or traditionally. It's the patient calls in when they need to see the doctor. They get scheduled, the doctor does what they can, and then and then the patient goes and, and the doctor really doesn't know what goes on outside of that visit. They don't know if they went to the hospital. They don't know how many specialists they went to. And so kind of changing that requires not only getting them to care, which is the incentive program, but also data, right? So yeah. the first thing we did as a company trying to support these doctors was how can we harness all this data? Well, the uh, Medicare Shared Savings Program gives you line level claims data. So we harnessed all that data. We said, okay, let's figure out where the opportunities are. You know, um, look at all these people go into the hospital. Well, they leave the hospital and they're readmitted because they don't know how to manage their meds. They don't know how to, you know, they're confused between what they had before and what they got in the hospital. They don't know, they don't really understand their instructions. How do we fix that problem, get them back in their primary care right away to have a conversation to hopefully avoid that readmission. And that's just one of, you know, hundreds of programs that you put in place, but you first have to have the data. You got to recognize there's an opportunity and then you say, okay, how then can I engage the patient, make sure um, that, you know, I talk to them and get them in front of the doctor at the right time, depending on what that program is. And, you know, through this kind of evolution of value-based healthcare, everybody's been talking about transforming the doctor. And personally, and not everybody would agree with me, but personally, I think it's less about transforming them than providing a support system. I think doctors, for the most part, do the right thing. If a patient's in front of them, it's just they don't have all the data. They don't have all the information. They don't know what else is going on outside of that visit. You know, providing them that. Also making sure we're proactive on, hey, look at this patient who's got a cardiac issue, who was in a, the ER six months ago. They have not been back to their doctor. Let me, let, let me call them and make sure they get in front of the doctor. If I can get in front of the doctor, the doctor's going to do the right thing. And so putting in all of those kind of processes and programs is what we did. Yeah. And I mean, you're, you're really describing chronic care management very, very well as, the, as, as an actual program. But um, there's, there's also the obvious challenge when you're the ACO or you're the, the value-based care organization and you're trying to do those touch points with the patient. But like you mentioned earlier, you're, you're not their trusted relationship. So how do you... What did that structure look like with actually communicating with the patients? Was that always via or through the doctor? Like you were telling the doctor what they needed to do with the patient well, or you were directly communicating? That's a great question because that's exactly what the difference is. So think about traditional disease management, case management from a payer. They call and say, hey, I'm United Healthcare. We'd like you to do this. Well, you just, you, you just um, cut your engagement ability, you know, 
by 90% by just saying I'm United Healthcare. Yeah. So what we did is we called on behalf of the doctors. We were connected into their appointment schedulers. You know, we, we, we acted as if we were sitting in the office next to the doc. You know, they didn't know we were a call center. We were just their medical assistant or their, or their front desk person. That's how we approached them. We're, we're calling for Dr. Jones. He recommends you come in. We've noticed that this, this, this is going on with you. And it's incredibly effective. You know, 50%, 60% engagement rates versus the 10, 11% from payers. If they call you and you can harness the call that when they call you, that my stomach hurts, I want to come in. Oh, by the way, we noticed that you have this um, care gap that we'd like to get closed, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you can harness that call when they're calling in, that's 100% engagement. It's incredibly powerful. Yeah, fantastic. So, um, the ACA comes out and, and what are you doing at the time? And did you, in the lead up to it, did you have any involvement in pushing that kind of legislation or, or did it just- We actually did. So at Rise Health, you know, I personally didn't make the trip to DC, but people of our team you know, on the team of Rise Health, it did actually, and met with, um, the, um, current HHS secretary, I'm trying to think of her name, um, and, uh, Emmanuel, who ended up becoming the um, mayor of, of Chicago afterwards, he was very part of that. And so we, the members of the RISE team met um, with those guys kind of when they were forming that legislation. So I think, I hope that we had some, you know, part of what the in, in legislation looked like, but who knows. And so how did that, um, what did that shift uh, in, in, in healthcare from, from the value-based care perspective, like the next day? What, what, how did that make well, it easier? Launched it. I mean, it launched it. There was, I mean, we had this great company, this great idea. We met with every kind of CEO of every health system around the country, every payer, never had a bad meeting. There didn't, there, there wasn't a contract. And so this launch of value-based healthcare couldn't exist without someone coming out without one of these contracts. And so that's what CMS did with the MSSP is they launched this whole, um, you know, value-based healthcare, you know, journey, I guess. Yeah. And so um, it was pretty powerful. And then you were able to take that and now you had something tangible to take to the docs and say, all right, sign up for this. Exactly. And that's what we did. We formed our own ACO in North Florida. Um, we Others, you know, it, what's unique about Florida is it's really led by entrepreneurial independent physicians. And it's probably why it's the most successful ACO market in the country because of that. You know, we didn't have a lot of the disincentives with driving costs down that hospital led C, I mean, uh, ACOs did. And so, you know, we partnered with those that, you know, doctors that were entrepreneurial that knew that this was kind of the next big thing, but didn't know how to really, you know, execute on it. And so we did kind of analytics as a service, care coordination, care management as a service, very focused on kind of understanding those systemic problems that drive cost. you know, because you said it sounded like case management. Well, I'll tell you that most of the time around the country, they look at the high cost utilizers and then put some nurses on there and call it case management. But when you get really specific on what lever, what systemic problem is driving that cost, you can get really, you know, actionable and, and really move that lever and know why you're moving that lever. So. Yeah. So when you're trying to move those levers, I find that, you know, and, and this is a question that I consistently ask and I still don't have a great answer for, but you can like, I feel like with this shift that you've really helped enact, you brought down the incentive, um, from let's say the government level to the doctor's level, right? Because you said, okay, government obviously wants to save money. No, they don't, but whatever. <laughs> they, they want to save money. Uh, now you're going to make the doctor, you're going to move that incentive down to the doctor. But at the end of the day, if you really, really want to actual, actually change in a very meaningful way, you have to get the patient on board because you can you can talk to the patient, you can send them a better text, you can send them a better engagement, you can send them a different flyer, you can send them a different program. But if you don't actually get the patient on board to be part of that conversation, and it's, a, you know, it's a t like you can't force that, that patient to change their habits and to change their behaviors um, to better their health outcomes. And you can give them more resources, perhaps, which I'm sure changes it to an extent. But if you want to really make that happen, you got to get the patient on board. Well, so, so one of my favorite lines, yeah. one of my favorite lines is that patient engagement is the next block buck blockbuster drug. Okay. You know, how powerful is that? As powerful as Lipitor was to heart, right? And so, it, and so I completely agree with you, but you know, it's not as hard. You, you always hear a lot of excuses. Oh, my patient won't listen to me. My patient won't do that. Trust me, we're all human beings. We all, there's all things that motivate us to do the things that you know, are good for ourselves, you know, and finding those buttons, you know, what is it that, and that's what people are now calling um, whole person care, you know, understand, you know, the longitudinal journey of a patient, really understanding, you know, when you're, you know, you can't walk because your feet hurt because you're diabetic and you're not doing all the things you need to. Well, 
you know, focusing in on what that patient wants to walk for their grandbabies or, you know, a trip they want to take, you know, run, you know, bringing that into the conversation and not just being about, okay, you need to lose weight or you need to stop doing this. You know, in, true engagement is understanding how to motivate. And I don't know that the doctor on their own can do that. There's just not, not enough time in the day. And that's where you have team-based care and different roles on that team that yeah. enable and motivate and, and have all the skills to do that. So, yeah. but I completely agree. If you don't engage the patient, you're going nowhere. No, it's a, it's a great answer. I mean, focus on the patient's why and you'll, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get there. Um, so the ACA rolls out, you guys start these contracts. Was there any initial, anything on such a grand level that you kick off a pilot like that? I'm sure that there were like pitfalls or things that you didn't expect or things that you expected to go well, didn't go well. Was there any kind of, um, any, any shockers one way or another, something that you didn't expect to go well, that went really well. And something that you expected to go really well that went the other way. Anything that stands well, out? Well, welcome, welcome to the world of startups, right? Yes. If you don't know how to pivot, you shouldn't be in that business. <laughs> yeah. Because it's a constant pivot. Um, I think the biggest thing was, you know, we 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 knew how to move the needle. We knew what the secret sauce was, you know, and and we were surprised that people didn't jump on board. Um, you know, everyone agreed that it was the right thing, but because there was no financial incentive contract, you know, I think the biggest lesson I learned that if you don't, if you can't take people down the, the money path, no matter how, you know, willing they are to, to care for patients and whatnot, it, it just doesn't work. And so you have to have those incentive models in place and you got to think about that first and, and get those contracts. And then people will then do the right thing. But at the end of the day, you know, practices are a lot of small businesses, right? Healthcare is a big business. And so you have to, you have to be practical when you're rolling out some of these models. I think, um, you know, really learning what motivates physicians, again, some of that's financial incentive, but it's not all that, you know, I think that's, you know, a big learning journey of, of why people would participate in these versus not um, understanding sometimes there's a big system out there that, you know, as much as you know, this is the right thing, you know, you've got to deal with historic um, love, hate relationships between payers and hospital systems. And, you know, changing them takes a lot longer than, than you'd hope. Um, I used to have one of my other favorite little lines is I was trying to get hospital execs down this path. And I said, guys, you know, either you're going to be Blockbuster or Netflix, you know, you don't want to be, you don't want to be Blockbuster stuck with all these buildings, you know, let's, let's try to move the dollar to physician health organization, keep people out of these hospitals and, and, and really think of the, you know, your revenue model differently. And so, you know, there's a lot of that stuff, but, you know, at the end of the day, we have moved the needle. Um, it, you know, even though it wasn't as fast, I think, all of us early on had hoped for. And so, and it's still moving the needle. People are embracing value-based healthcare as the answer to, to really solving for some of the problems in healthcare today. Fantastic. So let's talk about Medicare Advantage plans for a second. First, a little history lesson. What are Medicare Advantage plans and how do they come about? So, um, you know, you have the United States government, largest payer in the country, Medicare. Um, the Medicare Advantage was their attempt at offloading the risk to some of the traditional payers. Um, by doing so, those payers were able to create kind of unique benefit designs. So if you're a Medicare fee-for-service patient, you have complete choice to go anywhere you want. But you don't have prescription coverage unless you buy a supplemental pay plan. You don't have, you know, you, you don't have guaranteed, you know, out-of-pockets. There's just things like that that the when the government offloaded some of this uh, Medicare risk to plans, they were able to create some creative um, plans for people that got them to join on. Um, the way those plans worked is they were paid by the, the you know, profile of the patients, you know, where they, um, do they have three conditions, two conditions, were they pretty healthy and, and all of that gets identified through risk coding. And so Medicare Advantage really was paid based on kind of the risk profile of the patient population they took on. Mm -hmm. And so, and that was how they came up with, you know, in, in, in a non-competitive world where you set a premium and you see how much you sell and you move the premium to, to, based on the market, you know, this was the way for the government to pay these plans for these patients by using this kind of risk profile model. And so that was MA. And then you had the other half of the popu Medicare population, which is Medicare fee for service. And so, without moving all of those patients to Medicare Advantage, which had constraints on, it operated like HMOs, where, where you could go, what doctors, you had to stay within network, things like that. Um, they said, well, let's try something differently. Let's take that other population that's used to free choice, be able to go wherever they want, and let's 
move them into these ACO models where we'll let doctors manage risks versus these traditional payers and hopefully engage patients differently and send them to do things that, you know, were absent in the MA models. So sure the that. MA plan, the, the incentive to the design for the MA plan was really for the private payers? That's or that, Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really the government's, the government offloaded their, their risk, their health risk to these payers. So they kind of guaranteed, you know, what for these thousand patients who signed on to, you know, this particular MA plan, they knew that, that they were going to pay X thousand dollars or whatever it is per head for that patient. And so kind of that risk moved from the government to the payers. To the payers. So this just came out like, like last week, but there's a lot of people freaking out about the government um, uh, proposed to cut, um, not to get into all the details, but to, to, to make some sort of cut to the risk adjustments that, that these MA plans are able to make. And that's concerning a lot of people. And it seems to me like a lot of people that overlap with the value-based care world. So what are the applications for Medicare Advantage plans when it comes to value-based care? And what are they doing wrong? Well, what I see in the marketplace is that MA is shifting more towards some of the, the rules that they put in place with the ACOs. One of the things that I really liked about the, the ACO models initially even um, was that they kind of capped the risk coding, meaning that you couldn't just make money by making your patients sicker, which is one of the problems with the MA plans historically, because they really didn't, you know, if you look at overall spend for this nation as a percentage of GDP, you know, MA has, did not solve that problem. They didn't move the needle in the opposite direction. And, and the reason they didn't is they just started, they got really good at risk coding. That's what MA did in order to increase that amount of money that the government paid for those patients. So when CMS came out with the MSSP, they capped the risk coding. They also didn't attribute patients. They, they did kind of retrospective attribution, which means that attribution of who your patients were could change which means that you really had to engage them to keep them in your practice and part of your ACO. You couldn't just assume they're going to be there because they were assigned to you. Mm -hmm. And so that plus the cap on risk coding really, I think, um, forced these entities to drive the needle down. They had to really think of how to keep people out of the hospital, how to you know move the needle on costs, which was the right model to do. So they're going back to MA and they're saying, okay, let me, let me fix some of these risk coding rules on the MA side so that I'm not just making people sicker, I'm actually moving, I'm incenting these plans to really move the needle, needle down and, and reduce costs. So people are up in arms whenever you touch the revenue model that they're comfortable with. Right. But at the end of the day, I think it's the right thing to do for the country. Interesting. So you're saying the only real difference that allowed the, uh, the ACO model to actually be effective and when it comes to driving down costs was the cap. Well, I mean, there's lots of things. I mean, there, I think the cap is just one of the things, along with retrospective attribution and some other things that are in that model that really forced the people that got into the ACO space to, to manage costs versus just, it's kind of like managing a, in a business, you manage the revenue side or you manage the operational cost side. Well, you know, MA has kind of historically managed that revenue side and increased revenue, increased revenue, increased revenue through risk coding, whereas the ACOs through all the incentives that were built in really had to drive the, the cost down. And so these two models are kind of merging in some of the rules. And I think at the end of the day, if we don't figure out how to drive costs down this country, none of us are going to be able to afford health care, including the government. Yeah, I think we already kind of can't, can't afford health care. Um, but it's going to get worse if we don't fix I it. I know. Yeah. Yeah. So so what do we do, Nicole? If the country's yours, what do we do? What, how do we fix it? <laughs> oh, wow. King for the, queen for the day. Yep. Um, you know, I think, you know, like I said earlier, it, one of the disappointments is value-based healthcare hasn't moved faster. But, you know, some of the wins are that commercial has, you know, it, it started as a Medicare um, initiative, but commercial got in. Commercial tends to follow Medicare. And so, you know, almost every commercial um, payer in the country now has some kind of value-based healthcare model. Is it enough? You know, I think specialists have kind of been left out moving um, specialists into uh, managing care, you know, kind of creating the new benefits management company from a value based healthcare perspective, you know, replacing the traditional UM utilization management mother may I kind of model with more upfront decision support, having the payers embrace that as the way for real benefits management, getting out of the business themselves and moving it more and more and more to these, you know, organized doctors, specialist groups, et cetera, 
I think that'll move the needle. Um, you know, it's just, uh, I think, you know, if I was truly clean for the day, root cause healthcare, you know, why, why, why are, so right now the standard of care is I go to the doctor, I get a test and I either get a prescription or I get surgery, right? Um, how about we figure out why you have the condition you have, you know, and it's becoming a little in vogue now, but you know, food is medicine. It really works. You know, let's, let's go back and figure out, you know, when we, when we diagnose Parkinson's, maybe we should go look at the metals in, in, in that person's body to see what they've been exposed to and figure out, Ooh, maybe if we get rid of this mercury or this whatever, that we can relieve the Parkinson versus just putting a pill on top of the symptoms. Let's start to figure out what's caught mental health. Why are all our kids struggling from mental health? Maybe it's their diet's bad. It's full of processed foods. They're not getting enough exercise. You know, maybe if we fix some of those things, our kids will get happy you know, get healthier, happier, and, and not addicted to social media, you know? Right. So this, this, this is very interesting because now you're kind of going in a direction where, you know, it's becoming very, very popular. And I think healthcare should take this seriously because it's, it's just a reality, but it's becoming very popular in social media. And a lot of kids are looking at this, et cetera, et cetera. But you've got all these doctors like, um, you know, on the extremes, you've got like that liver King guy who recently, you know, saying he was, he was taking a bunch of, uh, bunch of steroids but you've got guys like carnivore md and these guys these you know that were doctors and they were very and they just got disillusioned with the system and they said hey this is ridiculous you got to focus on diet 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 you'll get rid of a bunch of chronic conditions you'll get rid of all these things um and then you've got the traditional medicine doctors that are like you know like like i talked to dr mike and he's i feel like more on the side of like no everything has to be evidence evidence-based care and, and this and the other and there's not really a lot of evidence to support these various things um and you're very very much in Tradi like traditional healthcare, you're, you're a healthcare, healthcare person. Um, but now you're talking about kind of looking at diet and root causes and, and things like that. Where, where, so I would, I would tell you that Dr. Mike, I haven't met him, but there is a ton of clinical evidence that's coming out around, um, root cause healthcare. You know, there's a ton of stuff. I mean, if you look for it, um, in fact, there's an amazing guy who, who should have on the show, Dr. Ed Eddie Maristana. Okay. He is a traditional doctor that went into precision healthcare. He, the, the number of patients that he has, uh, you know, cured their chronic conditions is incredible. Um, and he looks at just the clinical evidence. He's a real doctor. He's not, you know, a, you know, a wannabe or it's kind of periphery of healthcare that, that a nutritionist, et cetera, that not that they're not incredibly valuable, but who has gone into kind of precision medicine. This is the real deal doctor who looks at all the evidence. In fact, I had him speak at my conference, my keynote, he was amazing. And, um, but anyway, I, I think that, you know, if you look at stuff's coming out of uh, Cleveland clinic, Mayo, I mean, there's so much evidence around, let's step it back. Our bodies were built to heal themselves. What's wrong with our food supply? What's wrong with, you know, the way we interact with the world, you know, all of these things, you know, what's all these chemicals that's getting into our bodies. If we fix that, a lot of these chronic diseases will go away. Sugar. Oh, my God. We put so much sugar, and that is the cause of diabetes, right? And Alzheimer's are not even the same. So I think that there is a new standard of care that's right there for people to find. It's just that there is all these incentives between the pay traditional payers and the hospitals and the big pharma that keeps this, the current system in play. And um, Right. You know, so do, do you feel – would you go so far – like do you feel – because there is a sentiment that healthcare today, the state of healthcare today, and the way doctors are trained are basically almost just the gigantic dispensary for, for, for pharmaceuticals to say, okay, what's, what's the condition? What do I – what medication? What medication? What medication? And there really isn't a lot of looking at what you're talking about at all at root cause. Is that, is that really the reality? That's exactly the reality. That's insane. And, um, and I think even a lot of those doctors would like the support. But, you know, how do they get out of the mousetrap of seeing 20 patients a day? Do they have time to even think about this stuff? And so, you know, there's I've seen them. I see them coming out. Businesses that are going to come to help maybe support primary care and some of this more root cause analysis before we just slap a medication, you know, down. What, what could you do to really eliminate and get rid of these diseases. So I, I think it's coming, you know, you asked me if I was going to be queen for the day, that was to be my wish. So it's not here right now, Fantastic. but it's coming. Yeah. But you know what? I, I do agree with you. I think that the trend is trending upward and I think that the rise of social media and um, obviously it has its tremendous downsides, but um, I think that this is well, a, yep. I, I was going to say the only, and, and if we talk about health equity right now, you know, it's a big buzzword health equity. Well, what is, what is, you know, what is the work, the opposite of health equity when only the rich can, can afford precision medicine, because that's the reality. Cause trust me, 
um, people are out there getting precision medicine, they're getting stem cells, they're, they're looking at their metals, they're looking at their allergies, they're looking at all this stuff, they're changing their lifestyle, and they're doing it at, at a pretty you know, high cost because they can pay for all these tests. Well, the people being left out are the ones that can't afford it. And, right. and if we had to solve a health equity issue, that would be one of them to solve. So we need to supercharge value-based care payments and the incentive structure that we need to continue to drive down costs by actually looking at the root cause and just, just stopping yeah. things in, in 10 years, 20 years. Yeah, um, totally. Fantastic. Are you, um, are you still involved at all on a policy perspective or do you, are you communicating with, with Medicare or Medicaid and, and trying to, or the organization and trying to push the needle in this direction at all? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm still tapped into kind of the folks at CMMI. Um, I'm also part of the um, panel or forum that does health policy in Florida. In fact, I'm, I'm one of their um, panelists on the conference they've got coming up in May. And um, so, yeah, I try to keep my, my fingers in the, in the mix. Fantastic. Um, wow. Well, we could probably go on for, for, for hours and hours that really, you, you have an absolute wealth of knowledge when it comes to this and it's, it really is apparent and, uh, quite intriguing. So I, again, I appreciate the time. Um, where do people, where do people find you connect with you? What are, what, yeah. Where do people find you? Uh, LinkedIn, you know, I'm out there. I, I, um, have a pretty big network out there. They can always go to Flat Coast to check out our website, come to our conference in, October, I think late October, we have it this year. It's one of the best value-based healthcare conferences in the country, even though it sits in Florida. So come to that. And um, it's, all, it's a lot of fun too. So fantastic. <laughs> Lots well, of ways to get to you. Yeah. Well, Nicole, thank you. Thank you so much for the time. And um, yeah, thank you.